So welcome to all to this webinar, uh, the first of the Living Water uh, series, and this on the spiritual ecology of water. My name is Mark Hathaway, and I'm the executive director of the Jesuit Forum. And just in case you don't know what that is, uh, Jesuit Forum is a small nonprofit, and we work mainly on issues related both to integral ecology and uh, justice and right relationships with Indigenous peoples. Uh, we're a very small staff. There's just three of us. Uh, you'll be meeting us all in this webinar. So besides myself, Trevor Scott and Victoria Blanco. Uh, and the forum's been existence, in existence since about 2007, uh, but we've been doing these webinars for about the last two years. So as we begin today with this webinar, we're delighted to have uh, Joni, uh, Jesse, and Lena with us. Uh, we're just aware that we're beginning in a context uh, for, for those who are Christians, this is the first day of Lent, which is a traditional time of uh, really to kind of think about where we're at, <laughs> of conversion, of, of change, of transformation, and certainly around water, uh, and when we consider our relationship with water, there's a tremendous amount that needs to, to change when we look at uh, issues around water. So uh, really looking at that in terms of, uh, some people speak in terms of ecological conversion or change of heart, but really how do we uh, write our relationship with water? Uh, at the same time, we're very mindful that we're in a context of the events of this past week around the Ukraine, uh, uh, violence and, uh, you know, the difficulties of that. So we're just aware, not only of the people of the Ukraine, but all the peoples in the world who are, who suffer from violence or oppression, uh, conflict, or lack of the things they need. And one of the things that many people in the world lack besides food is, is clean, uh, safe drinking water. So that's also uh, when we think of how many lives are lost to that. So just have all those things in mind today as we begin. Uh, but right now I'm going to turn things over to Victoria, my colleague, who's going to uh, do a land acknowledgement. Thank you, Mark. Let us begin by acknowledging the sacred lands upon which we meet. We acknowledge these lands as living community and all of its inhabitants, the animals, the birds, the water creatures, insects, the fungi, the microbes, all who sustain life. The territories where we are gathered have been the site of human activity since time immemorial. This land from where I speak is the territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Kachun First Nations, the Onondawa, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations. And here the image is of one spoon and one dish, where the dish represents the living land of the Great Lakes. There is what there is but one spoon, meaning that we must take care of this land justly and peacefully and making sure that we have all that we need and taking no more than what we truly need for ourselves. At this moment, I invite those of you who are in different territories uh, to briefly name the people who have traditionally inhabited that land and the treaties that you are part of. And you can do that on the chat. Today, we meet on these lands, which are still the home of a myriad of living beings and the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge all of them with gratitude and remember our sacred responsibilities as treaty peoples, which call us to make concrete disruptive change. Let us ask ourselves today, how can we be in good relationship with indigenous peoples, with non-human beings, with the land and water? Thank you so much, Victoria. Uh, Trevor is now going to uh, introduce our panelists for today, so I'll turn it over to him. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'd like to introduce our, our panelists now. Um, I'll start uh, with uh, Jesse Cardinal. 
Um, Jesse is from the Kikino Metis settlement in Northeast Alberta, uh, where she grew up and resides. Um, and she is with the Keepers of Water um, uh, Conservancy uh, Advocacy Group in, um, in that part of uh, Canada. And she comes through um, that, her work through um, working with youth as a youth worker and social worker and has grown into roles of coordinator and uh, director for environmental groups. She is presently the executive director of Keepers of the Water, which is an indigenous led organization created to elevate decolonized traditional indigenous water governance by emphasizing indigenous land-based knowledge, language, and culture, particularly within the Arctic watershed regions. Um, Keepers of the Water it strives for an interdisciplinary holistic approach honoring and acknowledging that Indigenous peoples are inherent to the land and carry knowledge in their stories and songs from creation. And as their website says, and I do encourage you to, to uh, visit all, all of our panelists' websites, they're wonderful, such a resource. Uh, it says, Keepers of the Water are First Nations, Métis, Inuit, environmental groups, concerned citizens, and local communities working together for the protection of water air, land, and all living things within the Arctic Ocean drainage basin. And Lena Aziz, I introduce you to, who is with the Watershed Watch Salmon Society in British Columbia. She is the campaign manager um, with Connected Waters, um, with the Watershed Watch Salmon Society which is a science-based charity that advocates for BC's wild salmon and the waters in which they live. Watershed Watch Society, Salmon Society works to confront policy decisions at the federal and provincial levels to fill the gap that local communities uh, struggle with, highlighting the large scale issues affecting local waterways and their impact on migrating salmon. And Lena works in, to build relationships between people and local watersheds in an effort to encourage change. Or, oops, sorry, I've lost. Um, an effort to encourage change and a shared appreciation for the waters around us. And Lena enjoys collaborating across diverse interest groups, bringing the concept of water for life to the forefront of decision making in the lower BC mainland. And I introduce you as well to Joni. Joni McGuffin, along with her husband, Gary, um, who couldn't be with us this evening, um, but Joni and uh, Gary, um, again, for those of you who explore the website, or their website, uh, are very much a team, um, um, a husband and wife team in the work that they do. Uh, our Canadian explorers, conservation photographers, writers, motivational speakers, and documentarians and conservationists. And their most documented adventures have been about canoeing on waterways throughout North America, bicycling from the Arctic to the Pacific to the Atlantic Oceans, so they're very fit, <laughs> backpacking the entire length of the Appalachian Trail, and circumventing Lake Superior by canoe, which they've written about many of these adventures. And the McGuffins, Joni and Gary, are noted for their popular paddle sports instructional books on canoeing and kayaking, and a recent documentary uh, film called The Painted Land, based on their research about the group of seven artists within the Lake Superior uh, region um, and, and how the land has changed um, and the shoreline of Lake Superior, how that has all changed, well, how it's changed since the time of the group of seven painters um, around a hundred years ago. And Gary and Joni with Ruth Ogawa are the founders of the Lake Superior Watershed Conservancy, um, which is dedicated to the long-term sustainable health of the Lake Superior Watershed. And as its website notes, the Lake Superior Watershed Conservancy is a land trust that strives to be an international mo model for freshwater protection. To sustain a healthy Lake Superior Watershed for future generations, the Lake Superior Watershed Conservancy facilitates the implementation of rep replicable projects within the watershed. So 
we welcome, we're very pleased to welcome our presenters. And if I have missed anything in my introduction, I apologize. And please feel free to, to offer anything or even correct anything uh, that I missed. Wow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Trevor. So uh, just in this first five minutes before we get into uh, this rich, uh, you know, diverse knowledge that we have here in our panelists and I'm really grateful and each of them kind of working with different watersheds as well, which I think is, is really adds a, a wonderful dimension to this. Uh, I'd just like to spend about five minutes just kind of putting the, the webinar in context a bit, uh, particularly why, why this topic, why topic, uh, talk about living water, why talk about spiritual ecology of water, what do we mean by all of this? Uh, and I think it's really important uh, to reflect on water in our lives. Uh, each of us by body weight is two thirds water at least, maybe more, it kind of varies from person to person. But in many ways we're, we're living, breathing water. Uh, and you know, water, whatever happens to the waters is also happening to us. We are part of the waters in many ways. Uh, and water also connects us with our ancient origins. Uh, when you think about water as H2O, that hydrogen, when we talk about hydrogen, it all, all seems kind of so abstract, but hydrogen was birthed very shortly after the initial flaring forth of the cosmos. Like that hydrogen in your body is 13.8 billion years old. Uh, and the oxygen, the oxygen came from one of our ancestors who was a star. Uh, oxygen was formed in a supernova explosion over 5 billion years ago. We all are literally stardust. Uh, and, in, and by these two different elements, hydrogen and oxygen come together to form this really miraculous substance that has really unique properties in so many different levels that life would, as we know it, certainly would not be possible without uh, water. Uh, it's thought that water fell as rain on Earth for the first 300 million years of Earth's history. Uh, that, you know, kind of the, the mother of all rainstorms, I guess, uh, 300 million years forming the oceans and all those things. And, and the salinity of those ancient oceans and the salinity of our blood is the same. I mean, we have those ancient seas running through our blood. Uh, and we also know that, um, you know, we spend the first nine months of our lives in our mother's wombs in water, immersed in water, immersed in this tiny sea, like we're, we're born out of the, that kind of a, a sea creature in some ways. Uh, someone once, uh, I, I once heard an analogy that I thought was really interesting to ask someone in Toronto, like, you know, how far do you live from Lake Ontario? Well, if you're drinking you know, Toronto city water, uh, this is Lake Ontario. I mean, it's, it's inside of me. Lake Ontario is inside of me. And I guess, you know, since the water flows down from Lake Superior, some of Lake Superior is inside of me as well. But actually water connects us with all living creatures. This water that's in our bodies has flowed through all living creatures through all, that have lived through all of history going back, you know, hundreds of millions of years, it connects us with our ancestors, both human and other than human. Uh, so, and we also know that spiritually, so there's that physical connection, but there's also a spiritual connection to water that for many of us sitting by a river or sitting by a lakeside or swimming or being in water uh, does something with our being. Uh, it, it, it feeds our spirit, it gives us meaning. We, we need, you know, the beauty of water is something that, that is so important to us as, as human beings. Uh, and yet we also know that water is under threat around the world due to uh, especially industrial agriculture, deforestation, mining, pipelines, climate change, so many things, uh, dams on rivers. I'm sure we'll hear many of these things today. Uh, so, and only a tiny proportion of all of Earth's water is fresh that can be used uh, certainly by land-based creatures. So it's something very precious. 
Uh, so just as we go through this webinar today to be reflecting on, on our connection with water, uh, why it's so important in so many dimensions of our life and why it's so important that we protect it and uh, care for it, uh, both now and for, for future generations. So with that kind of uh, brief kind of uh, introduction, I'd like to begin our first round with our, our panelists. Uh, and I, in this round will begin with Jesse and move to Lena and then to Joni. But this one, this first round is a question about our, our connection and relationship with water. Uh, and I have a whole bunch of questions for the panelists, and they, but they kind of all kind of flow into each other. So how, how are we personally drawn into water? Is there particular bodies of water that we have a strong connection to? What are our experiences of water? How does that water sustain you both physically and spiritually? And uh, how does it give you meaning? Uh, and are there practices or teachings that you've received that have helped you to connect more deeply with water and to understand it more deeply. So uh, you're free to, to take any and all of those questions, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Jesse to begin with, and uh, then we'll do the round. So thank you so much for joining us, Jesse. Oh, thank you, um, Mark, for the really good um, opening discussion on water. That was really nice. And uh, to Trevor and Victoria for helping organize this. And um, and thank you to Lena and jo Joni for joining me on this panel and to everybody who's tuning in to talk about water. I love talking about water. Um, I, uh, I spend my days talking about water in some, in some way, shape or form. And so it's, uh, very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm just uh, bringing up the questions here to make sure that I'm, I'm answering the questions and not getting unless somebody can put them in the chat for me. But um, <clears throat> I know one of the first questions was uh, um, my connection to water and how I'm connected to water. Um, my experiences of water and I, I've told this story before and um, <clears throat> it's started from when I was a kid um, and it has a lot to do with how I was raised and so we didn't have running water and we didn't have like uh, gas we powered our our home with wood heat and we had a well outside and so that's where we got our water from and we hauled our water um, so I remember hauling our water I remember pumping the well and uh, we had a big metal barrel inside and it was covered with a piece of plywood might have even been a plastic barrel I'll have to ask but because we lived in that house until I was about uh, maybe nine ten years old and uh, that the taste of the water will never leave me the taste of the water was so clean and cold and refreshing there was nothing that will ever take that memory away from me so that that must have impacted me in some way um just knowing that and i think today of how many people just in even in what's known as alberta still Oh, they only have wells. So that's not a concept of the past. It's surprising actually how many people in uh, the rural areas are still only, that's their source of drinking water is the wells. And this is not treated water. They may do things to like get the, uh, the calcium buildup and things like that to, to get out of their water, but there's no, it's not going through a treatment system. And uh, so that's that's my um, how I I came to be with water. So um, <clears throat> and then how does water sustain you, enhance your life, give you meaning? How do you understand your relationship with a specific body of water? Again, I grew up swimming in um, what what's in my community. I'm from Kikano. Kikano is a Cree word. It means our home and the lake that 
is in our community is called whitefish so that that keeps our entire community alive right now so that's where we get our drinking water from i grew up at that lake so i grew up swimming in that lake since i was a little girl and um so that i'm definitely connected to that lake but at any water that we go to i i for me i i see the world that way so i can i can go anywhere um that there's a lake or a river or a stream um one of the things that I was taught on my journeys is that every body of water has a uh, water spirit or a water protector that takes care of that water. And so when you go to that water to give that that water um, an offering or to give that that spirit being or that protector an offering. Um, and, you know, and I, I, I didn't do research to come to you guys today. I can only share where I'm at in my journey right now, you know, and so I, um, I come with you with, with, with what little I have because there's so much more teachings out there to be learned. And that's, that's part of what's happening through our resurgence of our learning, our culture and our language and, you know, decolonizing even, um, when Mark was talking about the creation, you know, we all have our creation stories, even like the Cree in, in our area has creation stories, the Cree in other areas may have creation stories. And I know the people out East have their own creation stories and water is a part of all of that. Um, and I don't know how much time I have, cause I'm going to keep talking, but if you let me know how much time I have, so I, I know when, when to pass it on. Um, and do you experience water as something living? Definitely, yes. Water is um, water is living. So it's not like um, like if you guys are Christian, you would understand when you talk to God that you know God doesn't say yes. Um, you know, Jesse, uh, go, don't do this or do that. You don't hear a voice. It's the same thing with water. You know, it's that same spirit of like um, it's our it's in our spirit that those those conversations happen and those connections happen and in our heart and so everything's connected so when you're talking to water you're not only talking to water you're talking to everything that's um in the water and everything that's around the water you're talking to the sky and so that's part of what keepers of the water the organization that i work for um and that there's other organizations and and communities that are working on that right now is uh they're pursuing personhood. So corporations have person status. So like McDonald's is considered a person, um, you know, like I'll just name some more well-known ones, that kind of thing. They're considered people. So they have rights in court and rivers don't, they, they don't even have rights. Um, you know, the animals don't have rights. The land doesn't have rights. The air doesn't have rights. And so there's this movement happening globally where um, people are starting to say, you know, the, the water is a living being, it, it's alive um, and it needs to have rights and it needs to have a voice. And so one of the ways that they're trying, you know, cause we're trying to protect water in all ways that we can. This is one avenue that people are trying to do this is to get personhood for a river or a watershed and and you guys may have heard of like the magpie i think it's called the magpie river in uh, quebec um there's a river in new zealand where they're given personhood does that mean that the river will be protected i don't know but maybe it'll have the same rights as mcdonald's in court now you know and so that that's happening so we we definitely um part of my own personal journey is uh because i grew up I grew up in Kikano and so I actually grew up going to church and I also grew up with my papa and grandma, my, my grandfather who, um, both of my grandfathers are First Nations, but my, my papa Harrison that we used to call him, he had passed away now, but we used to grow up going to Saddle Lake and we were around ceremonies, all kinds of different ceremonies and, um, 
you know, my mom raised us that we were never, um, I wasn't, I was allowed to do that, you know, because I know in the, some Christian families that it's um, through colonization that that's evil or you're praying to the devil or whatever. And so I'm very thankful to my mom for giving me that, you know, freedom to go with my my grandparents to Saddle Lake to be around ceremony. And that's, um, that's where I'm connecting now on a very deeper and spiritual level on water, because I find in the churches that we don't do that. We don't take the time to talk about water and pray about water and um, in, in the churches I've been to anyway, to really dedicate time for, for the water. And we were also, you know, taught that these things don't have spirits. And so that's where I, I had to move on and seek out deeper connection for me to water and to all the living things. And so I have been reconnecting to my family in Saddle Lake and going to ceremony. And it's amazing how water is so water is like everything to do with the ceremony like it's just the center of the ceremony and um but it's not again going back to like it's not a standalone thing so you know i might have a cup of water here but um as mark said like it's it it ties to that water body so I, that's when i think of like you know connection to water so looking at these questions um the, that's the water that I'm connected to, what we can connect to any water that we go to. Are there practices or teachings that have helped you connect more deeply to water? So I guess I'm answering that question. And another thing that we're doing as an organization is um, really the board, we have an excellent board and they are making sure through our colon decolonization journey that we're doing more ceremony. So before we would just, you know, plan this event and, and do it and not take the time to pray about it. And, you know, and like we might do an opening prayer or whatever, but we're actually incorporating ceremony. So, you know, we will go to a sweat or we'll um, take the time to pray uh, for this event or for, and it, it all connects back to the water. So those are the practices that as an organization, we're starting to adopt more. Personally, what I also do is, um, what can I do in my home? So it starts in your home. And, uh, you know, in my journey of being connected to the water. So it started when I was in my community in Kikino and I was starting to see more land being cleared, more gas wells be put up. And I can't say that I was taught by my parents like that this was wrong or that the water, something inside of me just knew that. And I just, I felt it. And I was like so upset by it and I would like I would cry about it and I would feel angst about it and I remember I was like living away from the community I had moved away to go to school and go to work. And uh, if you could just cue me when I have five minutes, please, and I would come home and I would see this and I remember even one time uh, in a Muskeg area and th there was an oil well put up in my mushrooms land and I asked him he was sitting at the kitchen table and I said, I said, uh, Papa. Why did you um why did you let them come on our land? And I could see that like and I didn't mean to shame him or make him feel bad, but it was just my reaction and I wanted to tell him and I could see the the sadness or the maybe the the sorrow or the regret about it. But that's what they were doing to all of our people, you know, they were coming there and offering this money and, and that was what was being elevated in, in our communities at that time was money. And so that's, that's what was happening. And um, I felt very lonely because I would go to community meetings and I would talk about our lake, like the lake I grew up swimming in, and I would talk about the water and people would look at me like I had 10 heads and I would look at them and I would be like, this is our drinking water like you know and that was like 20 years ago and uh so then when i went to the keepers of the water gathering in fort chip and it was in 2008 and 2009 it was so overwhelming for me that i i cried because there was people from all over the world from different walks of life that were there to talk about water and i just i i it was just it set the path for where I am today to connect with people um, that are, you know, have that connection to water and are concerned about the water. And now it's a beautiful thing because what I'm seeing is that in our communities, there's more and more people that 
are, you know, especially in the younger generation, I see it. They're like, they're awake, they know, they see, you know, and it doesn't take them long to catch on that it's like, water is important, you know, and the corporations are, are, um, you know, they're killing everything, and we need to stop this. And so I'll stop there, because I could, I could go on. And I just want to thank you. And I look forward to uh, listening to Lena and Joni. Thank, thank you so much, Jesse. I, and I think this, this initiative you're talking about in terms of the personhood of, of the rivers is so, so important, not only from the legal point of view, but so that we actually begin to understand that that water is something living that has a life that has a spirit, and that uh, you know when you talked about your connection uh, to the water, I mean I think it's out of that sense of deep connection and ceremony can, and spiritual practices can certainly help us in terms of that deeper connection. That's what really helps motivate us to protect and and to work for. That so it, it's like doing it as as something that's almost like a part of ourselves in many ways like we we see it it just kind of comes out of us naturally i think that that's, that's a beautiful uh reflection so uh now uh we'll go on and uh listen to to lena looking forward to hearing your reflections as well on, on these questions Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Mark. And so wonderful, Jesse, to hear your words as you were speaking. I was just like, yes, I connect with that. I understand that. Yes, my childhood. And it just like helped me remember so much, um, so, so many points in my life where I've had these like special moments and connection with water as well. Before I start, I just wanted to say I am drinking water. Oh, sorry, it's blurry in my background. Uh, from the Coquitlam River, sorry, from the Coquitlam Lake in the uh, Coquitlam territory. Um, the lake was dammed over 110 years ago. Uh, it's the oldest earthen dam in BC. And unfortunately, when that dam went in, it effectively blocked the passage of sockeye salmon from the lake out to the ocean and back until there was a spill overtopping of the dike, sorry, the dam in 2008, when a bunch of kokanee, that's landlocked salmon, made their way out into the ocean. And, and came back four years later as full-grown sockeye and it was just amazing and the and and people in the community were just so inspired and, and so much in awe so um water and salmon just a, a beautiful connection there so um getting back to our questions here i was so what personally drew has drawn me to water my gosh so many things but i, I guess i'll start at the beginning or a little bit at the beginning um i was born in sri lanka uh, which is this beautiful, tropical, vibrant, very wet um, island in the Indian Ocean. Um, some of you might know it because of the long-standing civil war that happened through the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Um, some of you might have heard of it because of the terrible tsunami that uh, killed so many people in the Indian Ocean, including uh, along the coast of Sri Lanka in 2004. So, um, but yes, it's a beautiful island really wet, really humid and incredibly thriving. You throw seeds on the ground, you're gonna have a papaya tree or a banana tree or a curry leaf tree or whatever it is. So I grew up just like in awe of the, and almost afraid of the massive thunderstorms would have and the amount of water that would come through. And then uh, I, I, I was born there, but I actually grew up in, in Dubai in a, in a desert in the, in, in the Middle East. And it was super dry. And over there, we celebrated water. Like when it starts to rain, I remember times in school where we just remove our socks and shoes and run out into the playground because our concrete playground was suddenly full of water and we were wading through it and splashing about and we just celebrated it the whole time. And it was just wonderful. I remember the smell of water in the air before it would rain. And, and back then it used to rain maybe two or three times a year so it was really something that was celebrated and the color green this vibrancy was something that was kind of built into the landscape and the architecture um, in the city now i understand that they seed clouds for rain so don't know what's going on now but that's what it was like when i was growing up and uh, more recently when my family migrated to vancouver um, to this emerald city I just remember being blown away by the lushness and appreciating the rain in a whole different way than I did in, in Dubai, because now we lived in a temperate rainforest and I had to learn what that meant. 
Um, so throughout my life, I feel I've experienced and appreciated and been inspired by water to such a degree that I wanted to eventually work in water conservation. It's actually funny if you ask my grandparents, they'd be like, oh yeah, Lena's always been into this like environmental stuff. We don't know, like my grandparents would take me down to the beach in Sri Lanka when I was a kid. And I, I would always be really upset at people just throwing plastic bags you know, when they're done with a snack or whatever it is. And I'd just like go and pick them up and give them back to the people. And they'd often be embarrassed because I was like four at the time. So it was, it, they'd be like, oh, okay, this kid is just <laughs> picking up garbage and giving it back to us. So when you ask my grandparents about where, where uh, my love for uh, the environment and, and water comes from, it would often be, that would be the story that they remember. But yeah, I, uh, went to UBC and trained in, in geography, human and environmental geography and water conservation is kind of what I wanted to do. But of course, when you live in British Columbia, you kind of fall in with the salmon crowds. So it really was this wonderful bringing together of this incredible species, salmon, their life, their life cycles, the, the, the diversity of salmon and all of that. I quickly uh, learned so much about that and just appreciate it even more the importance of water, not just from a human perspective, but from um, the larger watershed perspective as well. Um, an experience that is important to me around water, um, more recently, I say recent, but it's been maybe five years now, I got the chance to do a trip down the Fraser River from source to sea. So the Fraser is um, drains a third of our province. It's about 1400 kilometers long and I got to do this trip with seven women as part of this um, educational experience and it was it just blew my mind to see our province from from the perspective of the water um, it was sorry it kind of gets me emotional but it was just amazing for me to think that being a first generation immigrant to this country and then learning about the water and the history and the often very traumatic history of this place. It was just this really amazing experience to, um, to yeah, see from the perspective of water, from the perspective of salmon and sturgeon and, uh, and just like experience the biogeoclimatic zones as they shifted and changed <laughs> as we came down towards the ocean. So I guess that was a very, uh, it was informative, but it was definitely, um, an experience that made me connect much more deeply with the Fraser, which is the watershed that I focus almost all of my attention on for work as well. Um, let's see, what else do we have? How does water sustain you? Gosh, um, I f how does it give me meaning? Oh, I found this one a little, as I was thinking about this question, I found it a little bit challenging to answer. As I said earlier, I did my undergrad in geography, so I absolutely love understanding how water flows and how it carves out land and brings life, but it also takes life away. So it's an incredibly humbling um, understanding to have of water. Um, and I guess it like quite literally sustains me because I have my career based on this work. So in that way, I guess it does literally <laughs> support me. Um, and I feel like I have a huge responsibility to support it back. And again, like, I always came to think of water, not from our human need, which is where we often think about, uh, but in British Columbia, at least we are so blessed with, with an abundance of water for most of the year that um, I often think about what we're doing to impact the land in such a way that it affects um, animals. And in particular, how uh, through, the, through my work lens, how it affects salmon. So for work, what I do is look at the impacts of um, our human, our built environments on habitat, on water, and on fish, and, and opportunities to change the way we interact with our water so that we are improving um, salmon's ability to, uh, to, to reach their um, juvenile or their spawning habitats. So in particular, look at the impacts of flood control structures in the lower mainland, because the lower mainland is probably the most dyke jurisdiction in all of Canada. And in, the low mainland is also where little baby juvenile salmon um, come through on their way out to the Fraser, uh, out of the Fraser River into the Salish Sea and out into the Pacific Ocean. And uh, they need the small side channels and tributaries and sloughs all, all along the Fraser 
to overwinter in, to rear in, to learn how to hunt and feed and become strong enough so when they go out in the ocean, they have the best possible chance of life. I'm sorry, my, my cat just <laughs> came brushing in. Um, yeah, so over the past eight years, I've been, a lot of my focus has been on the Fraser watershed. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about the tributaries and sloughs of this area. Uh, so I just wanted to briefly touch on some practices or teachings that have helped me connect more deeply with water. I come from a Muslim background. And so in the Islamic tradition, water has a huge role to play. Um, I was actually thinking when Victoria was giving her land the land acknowledgement that the one dish, one spoon concept was similar to what we, uh, that we have in Islam as well, which is we as uh, the human, as human society have a responsibility to share and water is a common that we need to share and we need to take care of because it's, because there is a finite amount of it on earth. Um, and so, yeah, this is a code in Islamic tradition. The Quran talks about the foundations of water conservation uh, it, it, to a depth that I'm still trying to understand and, and learn about and reconnect with because I haven't really, um, haven't really spent much time exploring that side of, um, of the religion. And yes, it lays out the rights and the responsibilities of people towards water. One very small example is um, um, next month, we'll, Muslims around the world will be starting to fast from dawn to dusk during the month of Ramadan on the Islamic calendar. And it is recommended that when we break our fast, we break it in meditation and with water. So you drink water because when we fast, we don't drink water either. So um, that is just like, it brings back life. It brings back energy. And uh, yeah, that's just, um, that's just a little example of how the Islamic tradition also has a lot to say about about water and water conservation yeah i'll stop there for now thank you so much you know, that was lovely uh, thanks so much for sharing yeah and and you know i i'm thinking too you know when i kind of grew up uh a lot of my my youth was spent kind of at the the what's really the, the headwaters of the Columbia River and, and the Lisa had been dammed and the salmon no longer reached there and how that affected particularly the, the local indigenous people who, who depended on the salmon because it just disappeared so uh, because of the dam. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, so now we'll move on to, to Joni for, for this round. Hi there. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for uh, all of these words that have begun this conversation this evening. Um, Mark, you reminded me of a small children's book that David Suzuki wrote about the water and the raining for millions of years. And that the same water that flows through us today is the same water that has flowed through all life here uh, on Mother Earth. And um, that was a very impactful children's book. I remember when I read that and, and Jesse working on a huge watershed. I felt kind of overwhelmed in our work for a long time about the idea of walking on, working on a whole watershed. <laughs> and it's just really come forward with so many Indigenous nations uh, working uh, to bring about a knowledge of working in watersheds is the way water is, as it knows new geopolitical boundaries that we might put uh, lines on water, but they are really pretty meaningless to water. And, um, and, and thank you so much, Lena. Uh, I looked on the structures on your website. I encourage everybody to look at these salmon structures on their website to see how technology is helping the salmon get upstream safely um, and not endangering their lives. And um, I would like to share my screen for a moment just to talk a little bit about uh, what um, has personally drawn me to water. Um, let me see if I can do this. I hope that my screen isn't a huge mess here. Just a second. <laughs> um, home. Uh, I just have to get my slideshow started here. Okay. <laughs> um, 
I grew up luckily having parents who took me on the water. Um, I grew up in the watershed near Georgian Bay, um, the waters that flow down from Algonquin Park near Lake Ontario, so the lower Great Lakes. And getting on the water as a child is very impactful, not only for um, just that immersion of clean water, as you so described, Jesse, the waters were very clear in the lake I spent my childhood in. And I very much remember uh, the taste and the coldness of the water and how beautiful that was. And um, having the sounds of water and the sounds of the beings that live with the water. And so our summer residence of the loons was always part of my childhood and has continued so. Um, I came to know water in kind of an interesting way uh, in meeting my husband, Gary, um, when we set off in a canoe from um, the salt water on the Atlantic side and paddled a canoe uh, up the St. Lawrence and through the waterways, the Great Lakes. And we went upstream and downstream across watersheds uh, to take us all the way to the salt water up in the Northwest. And that um, journeying on water in that way that connected us to the flow of the land um, and the people who lived in many different places all across this land was a very, very impactful way uh, to, though I knew it at that time just as Canada, I knew the route as largely a Voyager canoe route. <laughs> this is 40 years ago. And um, I've, you know, since come a long way, but um, these um, beginning times of growing up with water and then having this time to journey on water at least gave me this very um, uh, in my bones uh, connection to water as a flowing being on the land that the water all connects and as you cross watersheds you just okay now you're flowing with the water down into the next lake on and and it's all that connectivity that we never see these lakes and rivers as separate beings anymore and uh we loved our travels on the North Shore of Lake Superior, which my mom and dad had introduced me to as a child, though I never went there. They used to go there every year and bring back these great stories of the wave wide sand beaches. And so later Lake Superior has really become a big, big part of my life. And right here in the heart of Turtle Island at the top of the Great Lakes lies a body of fresh water that's the greatest expanse on earth and it is uh, well, a lot of people liken it to the shape of a wolf's head. And it is quite an amazing thing to think that you can see and recognize that body of water all the way from way out beyond our, our beautiful Mother Earth. And um, a, a further journey, because this is my experience with water um, for many years, has been long distance uh, travels on water and spending three months circling this great body of water, um, I was able to experience it uh, as a whole being again. And so those political boundaries between countries, states, provinces, uh, and everything just become really quite uh, non-consequential. They're there, but they the water is all connected. And when you paddle it like that, you really experience it like that. And as you paddle along and you paddle past the rivers, you see all like these 200 rivers and all the little streams that feed the rivers. It's a watershed. And everything that is affecting every single one of those rivers is affecting the lake as a whole. And then it in and of itself is affecting all the lower Great Lakes and a huge amount of life has been drawn to living on these lakes uh, because of the water. Uh, there are beautiful rivers that I have explored in many ways, um, hiking them, paddling them, seeing them in all four seasons. Uh, this is one that's on the Eastern shore, the Sand River. 
this is right in my backyard. I am right now, um, though it's a snowy landscape as I look out the window, <laughs> uh, you know the base of these high hills that are some of the highest hills in Algoma. And this river here flows out from these, um, the headwaters beyond uh, King Mountain, way beyond, uh, out the Guli River, out into Guli Bay and Chiwekwedon, as an elder down at Guli Mission told us this year, is uh, the place that hugs you. And so this beautiful bay on the eastern shore of the lake is this place that hugs you. Um, water for myself and later my daughter, Sila, uh, is a place of being immersed in it. The idea of swimming in water has always been a friendly experience to me because of the water being clean, because of the water in the summer being warm. I don't live in the mountains, for instance. And this precious gift of immersing yourself in waters, waters that you can drink, is not something that... Um, everybody gets to experience, but it should be an experience of every life being. It is a gift of life. It is life. And being able to gather your water uh, from the ground that bubbles up in a spring is something that was always clean and no one ever worried about at one time. And now there are many concerns and groundwaters are especially vulnerable because we don't see them. And so when we put things down into the ground and then they affect these waters that then keep flowing through all the veins of the earth, uh, they come up and become part of us. Uh, being able to be by water with our child, big open expanses of it on the Great Lakes has been an amazing um, experience to um, just look out on water so vast that it brings tears to visitors' eyes who come here from other places who've never seen this much fresh water. To catch your food from the water, uh, there are some 80 species of fish in Lake Superior, and uh, whether it's the rivers that you fish or the waters of the lakes, um, not that long ago, several generations ago, uh, there were villages all around at every mouth, uh, river mouth, there were people living because there were, uh, there was fish abundance. But this fish abundance was um, taken and harvested to the extent that it is now no longer supporting whole villages at the mouths of the rivers and huge impacts like the uh, sea lampreys, for instance, that have come through the waterway systems of the canals um, and the locks uh, have changed forever the uh, composition of the Great Lakes. Um, and it's really important to be aware of these things. And as you, you if you travel by a canoe, uh, you're very aware of the connections to the land because although this vessel that's in this photograph here is not made of the materials of the land, this certainly this vessel was born of the land. Um, the birch bark, the uh, ash that would have been the gunnels, the wooden paddles that we are using are woods of the forest. Um, the cherry, the ash, um, and we love um, just the whole I idea that, uh, and people who have these skills of bringing back the abilities to um, create canoes and harvest, um, cultural harvesting I see in our area for birch bark for all kinds of different products uh, from baskets uh, to um, being able to once again make canoes uh, is certainly something you start to see again here. Um, just walking up rivers, uh, paddling down rivers uh, as we come to know water as people who journey by canoe uh, the water is a tremendous force, but if you can learn how to travel with it, you can use that tremendous force and travel safely. And water can do all kinds of amazing things with you and for you as, as you travel along on it. And you can be quite safe if you learn the skills to be able to do that. I've spent 
many, many nights of my life um, camping beside water, and there's nothing quite like camping beside Lake Superior. Um, there is the experience of the colors of this water and the sensory experiences of water uh, that would have always been and still continue to be uh, such a source of uh, importance to human life from time immemorial as you paddle along in a canoe and you come across a wall of rock painted with red ochre and the stories and symbols um, and connections to humanity that has been here for thousands of years and those family connections still here um, tell of a time and a time still existing of a relationship with the land that um, we're very fortunate to have many Indigenous nations to be bringing forward so much knowledge now from my colonial ancestry. I did not receive those kinds of teachings, but I'm grateful for them now. To sit along the shores of these waters and see the colors of water to see the ancient rock that holds the water here in Northern Ontario, this Precambrian shield rock. It, um, it's holding the water like a cup holds water. It's a big, big cup. <laughs> um, where the water comes from, watching storms over water, um, water travels and, and, and then it flows down. And at this time of the year, because of the high hills in our area, we get lake effect snow that falls in these hills because the winds that come across the lake pick the moisture up on the open waters and then dump it here in the hills. The colors of water and the flow of water uh, these are all Gary's images and his relationship with water and his eye for telling stories of water's um, beauty, um, its uh, ability to reflect the forest in all of the seasons, uh, the sound of water, the textures of water, whether it's the wind rippling over it or it's the movement of water uh, because there are rocks underneath it, uh, a little um, bit of water flowing over sand makes this amazing pattern happen. Um, even water that can look like the wing of a bird. Water is so beautiful in all its forms. At this time of the year, the layers of water silent and still as ice and water that falls and makes sort of a plinking sound with the rain. Water that makes a sound against sand that's really soft and swishy and beautiful on the big sand beaches or it's big and thundering when the, the big storm waves roll in against the rock and spray skyward. Uh, water has so many beautiful personalities and um, I'll just stop sharing here. Uh, as we bring forward um, our, our understanding of water, um, are there particular um, experiences of um, knowing water as something living? I, I think perhaps I have really, um, I really have uh, acknowledged that feeling that has evolved for me. I will say that in the practices and teachings that help me connect more deeply with water, I've been very fortunate to live here at Bawating amongst um, many Indigenous nations and have been to many circles and ceremonies in the past while. And I have learned a much deeper connection even to our preserves conservancy that Nanabajung is off Lake Superior Provincial Park is not a wilderness paddling destination, but it is a traditional unceded territory of immense um, community and nationhood importance. Um, I think I will um, end there for the next speaker to talk, but uh, thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you so much, Joni, and thank you for the both the beautiful words and the beautiful images, I think they're very evocative of the beauty of water. Uh, when we were talking about how water feeds our spirits and how uh, I, I think as, as humans, we're just drawn to be by, by water and in water and with water. 
and certainly those images, you know, <laughs> portray a lot of, of why. So thank you. So uh, in in the second in the second round, which is a bit shorter, but we're going to do two shorter rounds now. Uh, we want to look consider a bit our broken relationship with water, or how water is under threat. Uh, so things like you know what changes have you seen have you seen or experienced in the water that you've been connected with? Uh, how has your relation to water changed as a result? Uh, what are some of the key threats to the bodies of water you love or other concerns? And how? And then your respective organizations, how did you form your vision and how are you working to protect specific bodies of water? So we're starting with, with Lena this time, so I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Lena. Wonderful. Thanks, Mark. And wow, Joni, just breathtaking. I love your storytelling and your pictures as well. Just gorgeous. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I think one of the um, every whenever I travel, I love to go and check out uh, the closest body of water. Like what watershed am I in when I'm in Lisbon or Rotterdam or wherever it is? And I was down um, in the bay in, in, in Lisbon and, and the estuary has been completely walled off and completely dewatered. And it's just like a wall to the edge and then you have water and there's like nothing in between, which is really, really sad and really sad to see just um, what it means when we think of development. Um, closer to home, when I did the Fraser River trip uh, a few years ago, we were coming through some really um, parts of the Fraser River, River, especially when it goes through the canyon, I have no settlements in them. And so it's, it's really quite wild and it's just, you know, like cacti and like snakes. And I, I had no idea that was even happening here in our province, just so incredible. But then as we came down through the canyon and the river kind of splayed out through the through the lower mainland. Um, you see such a difference in how the water is treated. Um, you start to see more embankments. You start to smell um, the manure being put on the fields. Um, you start to see a sheen on the water from a runoff into the into the river itself. Uh, you start to smell um, the pollution, you start to see the smog in the air because this is happening in the summer. So all of these things are much more uh, in the forefront. And it's, um, and you start to see how slowly over time we have started to degrade this, this waterway just bit by bit. We never think about it as a whole. We, we break it into pieces and we give permits for this or licenses for that. And let's just remove some trees here. It's not gonna be a big deal. Oh, a little bit over there. And slowly we're starting to degrade the watershed as a whole. Uh, we saw the impacts of that with our November floods uh, just this past year. Um, I was lucky. I was actually on the road the day of the floods and I was coming through the Fraser Canyon um, and we were stopped for traffic and we thought maybe it was construction up ahead, but the water was flowing ever so fast off the canyon walls and just like flowing across the road. There was just so much water everywhere and I was getting really nervous um, driving. And then we came to a standstill and couldn't figure out what was going on. And of course, at that point it's pouring rain so no one's getting out of their cars. And all Google Maps keeps saying is it's a five minute delay, but then slowly we learn as people like, pass information down the line that there was a landslide and it was it was absolutely horrific to think that we could have been in the middle of that a four-hour trip became an over 12-hour trip one of the highways we took actually every highway we took got washed out in the end um, and it was it was really incredible to think of the impacts of climate change on the way water works and, and, and on the way water flows so just, you know, you, you, you just see it every day. Uh, with my work, I focus, as I mentioned earlier, on the impacts of flood control structures. So that's dikes, pump stations, and gates. The impacts of those hard infrastructure on waterways in, and our, my focus is in the lower mainland. These, these structures um, are run along the length of the Fraser River, 
blocking off uh, tributaries, um, side channels of the Fraser and sloughs. These are the waterways into which the river would have naturally flowed into, especially during a high flood event. But now because of the, of the blockages, it means the water is rushing down the mainstream of the river, eroding islands as it goes, eroding land that might not be protected by uh, dikes and unfortunate fun fact on that. I use the word fun in a tongue in cheek kind of way. Um, the most, most communities that are at risk of flooding through um, our indigenous communities along the lower Fraser that were systemically um, built in a way or like placed in a way where dikes were built to not protect them. So an incredible injustice done right there. Um, so when we look at threats to water, what I'm seeing are impacts of uh, like poor water quality, terrible, uh, like a water quantity, like the amount of water in these side channels, tributaries and sloughs are, especially in the summertime, are like almost negligent. There's like this much water in some of these waterways or they're packed full because they're so warm because the water is not moving as it naturally would because they're, they're held back by gates or, or dikes. Um, they're really warm water and salmon would be literally cooking in them. But they are fantastic for all kinds of invasive species that outcompete salmon and other native species that would otherwise use these waterways. So we're seeing a lot of this on the ground. We have uh, our field crews that go out and do uh, you know, baseline data collection. And, and this is what they're seeing, more invasive species, more invasive plants that are uh, just like filling up uh, and, and uh, overtaking these natural waterways. And, and, and creating less and less habitat and really squeezing out salmon. So that's a huge issue. Um, so Watershed Watch, so why did our organization form? We were actually formed by a group of very concerned uh, uh, recreational fishers who were also biologists and conservationists who wanted to make sure that you know, wild salmon would be, uh, wild salmon in healthy BC waterways in perpetuity was the vision there. And that was, that's what we try to address every day. Me, through our interaction with flood control infrastructure and changing the way we manage for floods in the lower mainland. But we work on uh, the fish farming issue. We look at the amount of water there is. Uh, uh, we we want to ensure there's enough water the, um, in the waterways for salmon. So because we are, we are huge users of it. We keep them behind dams. We pull them out for farming and, and irrigation. And are we leaving enough water in the in the rivers for salmon. So that's a huge focus of our work as well. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Lena. And I'm sure you know that I also have heard with regards to both the droughts and the floodings that uh, deforestation, of course, and clear cutting in BC is a huge issue related to that to watersheds. So uh, yeah, it's huge, the, the, the number of challenges. So now uh, next we're going to go uh, with Joni. Uh, on this uh, round? I guess I'm comforted by photographs. So I'm going to just share my screen again. <laughs> and um, I'll just bring up my, oops, uh, let's see here. Oh, all right. That's not going to work for me. Sorry about that. Let me just try it. One more time here. Get again to the right spot. Okay. Um, there are many things that have affected my life in seeing water. Probably the most impactful at the very beginning was to see the outflow pipes along the St. Lawrence River going directly into the St. Lawrence and understanding the effects that uh, chemical pollutants were having on the white whales back 40 years ago. Uh, we see small insults to water, such as just something like this, where we just as um, maybe it was Jesse or Lena that uh, talked about just picking up the garbage and just seeing that sort of insult to the land by letting things that are wasteful just be tossed into to water. And um, I just experienced um, big transformational types of things around water in paddling these waterways when I first came up through the locks in 1983 and came through and passed uh, the steel mill 
and it's a big feature of the economy of this city and the um, industry as in many industries sit right on our waterways and <clears throat> there have been huge impacts to the um, ecology and the quality of the water and what we've done to the water uh, because of the proximity here that has a lot of improvements have been made but we still don't put water first and many of the things end up in the sediments of the bottom of this river which is one of the areas of concern and an international area of concern for the Great Lakes. Uh, another area that we notice a huge big impact that people don't always see is enormous transformational things that we do to water, such as around the only outflow to the largest freshwater lake on the planet here at the St. Mary's River was completely transformed in a very short period of time at the end of the 19th century when the locks were put in. And when the locks were put in, the water is diverted, um, almost half goes around for electrical production over in the United States uh, through the waterway that you can see and then into the foreground ground um, on the Canadian side and only a small percentage of it actually goes down the whitefish uh, the rapids which was a tremendous source of food and um, a gathering place at Baoting for th thousands and thousands uh, since time immemorial. Um, and we show maps showing what the islands look like and what everything looked like before of that transformation when we do our tours. Uh, this map is a little bit old, a decade old, but it does show um, that it's that cumulative impact of industrial processes. There once we'll see, um, you know, an effective industrial logging over here or we'll see infective um, a mine over here and we need to really look at these things in the context of the whole time frame of um, and the whole history of it and the flow forward into the future and understand that it is not just something that is an isolated point on the land but it connects to all the flow of the rivers and the waters and what we do in one place affects everyone else and um, there is um, an important iconic um, feeling to have in your mind about water too is the watershed picture and here we look at it of all the great lakes I mean um, if they put a line around the Great Lakes here and call it a country, they said it would be the third richest country in the world because it's the water at the heart of this place where we live that has given such wealth. Uh, we formed a conservancy, a land trust, um, a few years ago, um, and it was to support the vitality of the watershed. Um, and we wanted to do this in ways that brought communities together around active participation, education, and land trusts are uh, largely about um, either acquisition of lands to protect ecological and cultural um, parts of them, or um, um, or else there's other things that we have done as the Lake Superior Watershed Conservancy, all the 20 islands off. What was originally, I would have said, Lake Superior Provincial Park, I now really do see this as Nanabujang. This is the traditional unceded territory of Batuana First Nation and these islands are a very important um, cultural um, and, and an amazing also um, heritage place along the coast for the Métis Nation. And uh, these places were both places where there were villages, people living here. And when the park came, the story that's told at the visitor center is that the Métis Nation moved away. Well, they didn't move away, their houses were burned down. Um, people were not uh, moving out uh, from Batuana First Nation, their houses were burned down. And so people are now coming back to the land and to these places and telling, we have to know the truth before we can have reconciliation and these are some of the hard truths of the stories about our protected lands be them national or provincial parks um, one of the wetlands um, that we preserve is um, on the shores of uh, Chigwe Quedon, Guli Bay, and it's a small wetland, but it represents the flow of water for the Hudson Bay lowlands. It's a rich peatland, and so a very complex ecosystem to explain, but here in a small way with the new boardwalk and infrastructure we put in. 
Um, I'll just finish here with the work of the water trail and putting that in as part of our work as the conservancy to get people on the water. Um, we set about um, connecting to the Trans-Canada Trail and to the other water trails around the lake, but as a, uh, a connected cultural um, connection to the whole lake through Indigenous nations is the most important part of this work. And um, I'll finish on this image, which is our Canoes for Conservation program, where we have big canoes that we put on the water and um, getting people on the water is a really, really important way to, to reconnect people back to the water. Thank you so much, Joni. Once again, beautiful images yeah. as well. <laughs> uh, so now, uh, turn it over to Jesse to address this, this questions around our broken relationship with water. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I'll start out with telling you guys how Keepers of the Water was formed. It was formed in 2006. And so the area we work in is the Arctic Basin and it's massive. Um, a lot of our focus is in the Athabasca River and, and uh, the Slave River, the Peace River. They all flow into the Mackenzie River, which eventually flows into the Arctic Ocean. Um, and so in 2006, there was a lot of industrial activity happening. The tar sands is in this watershed. It's one of the biggest industrial projects on the planet. And at that time, communities were noticing there was a change in the quality of the water and the quantity of the water, drastic changes. And uh, at that time, Alberta was known as what, what was a boom. So there was a lot of industrial extraction happening at that time. And so people gathered up in um, the Decho is also, that's another thing we're working on is trying to re rename the to the original names because the Mackenzie was named after, you know, some, some random white guy that went down the river, but it had a name before that and it was called the Decho, which means big river. And so up in Northwest Territories, um, people gathered, the Dene people gathered with other people at that time on the banks of the river and they made a declaration and in that declaration it states that water is sacred and that way we must work to protect it and that kicked off the keepers of the water and so the people that have been involved have been you know water keepers or water protectors even before keepers of the water was formed the dead like as indigenous people we have that um that's part of our natural law and our teachings from creators that we need to live in harmony with creation so those were teachings given to us from the beginning of time and uh so as um as this organization was formed we started having annual gatherings in different communities and in different indigenous communities to talk about water and so we've had them in uh, northern BC and Northwest Territories in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Uh, sometimes these communities have been remote fly in only communities and the topic has always been water. And, uh, um, you know, we, we hear from the communities, what are the concerns with the water? So one example in 2015, we had uh, keepers of the water gathering in Bushy River, which is in northern Alberta and Treaty 8. And um, there's so many oil spills that happen. And uh, that's a whole other issue because the AER isn't documenting them properly. There's actually a book out written by one of our colleagues, Kevin Timoney. It's called The Hidden Scourge. And he talks about how um, basically there's corruption within the Alberta Energy Regulator because they'll say a spill is cleaned up and it's not and they're not documenting it properly so in 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 2015 in Bushy River in this First Nation it was a Dene community they were saying we had a massive spill in our lands <clears throat> you know we can't um we can't even go out onto our land to hunt and fish and trap because of this spill because it's toxic we don't know how it's going to affect us the government said the spill was cleaned up the alberta energy regulator said the spill was cleaned up they signed it off they were gone so the community is now left with this this mess to clean up at their cost and so what we did was we partnered with that community and we brought in actually kevin timoney and i think he writes about it in that book um 
who is an independent scientist and we did independent studies to prove that no the land is not cleaned up you know and then we we tried to take that information further and um, so one of our biggest challenges right now is the tar sands because as i said it's a it's one of the biggest industrial projects on the planet and um there's 19 tailings ponds there the tailings ponds are toxic um anything that lands on the tailings ponds will die and the the the, the scary part about it is the tailings ponds on a blue sunny day they look like a lake um i have a picture i don't have it here sorry but there's a i have a picture of a lake i was on my way to montana <clears throat> and there's a mountain lake where it's <clears throat> it's so blue and and crisp and clean and then there's a tailings pond and it looks the same it looks like a lake and uh so that's why a lot of the birds they'll, they'll land on them and as soon as they land on them they die one quick fact I wanted to give you guys, this is an article from the Narwhal, but this information comes from a report called the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. There are 125 trillion liters, <coughs> excuse me, as of 2018, 125 trillion liters of toxic tailings in northern Alberta, in just north of Fort McMurray. <coughs> and um. And so that would be enough drinking water for a million people for 1700 years. Um, and so that's that's part of what we're facing right now. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I got a frog in my throat. I got to have a good drink of water. But um, so what's happening right now is the Alberta government wants to start dumping these tailings into the Athabasca River. They're saying that they can treat them clean enough to be treated some more <laughs> they're not saying that they're safe enough for to drink um but what we know through our science people so that we're you know it's western science and traditional knowledge so this science comes directly from the information that industry and government is providing it is not safe there is high levels of saline so any kind of saline and fresh water will raise the temperature it will kill everything plus there's something called methanic acid which i'm learning about Nathanic acid is a cancer, uh, cancer causing chemical. So these things are still in this uh, that we know of. Of course, there's like mercury and all kinds of like major toxins in these tailings ponds that they claim they can treat. But we don't know this. This is just based on what they're saying. So we haven't had any independent study. So this is like um, uh, a climate. It's like it would what I'm saying it is, is it's an international human rights crime if if they start dumping the tailings ponds into the Athabasca River, it will it's an international issue also because the waters flow into the Arctic Ocean. So I don't know, I'm thinking I may be taking up my time, but that's that's part of what we're working on. We work on a lot of issues and uh, uh, you can go to our website to read more about that. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, that uh, I know I, I read quite a bit about the the higher cancer rates in the in the indigenous communities near the 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 oil sands as well. So certainly, you know, if they're going to start putting that into the river systems, that's extremely concerning. Uh, thanks for for alerting us to that. I think that's it's a very important issue to be be thinking about. So. In this in this uh, next round, uh, we really want to be thinking about what we can do to to move forward to write our relationship with water, and uh, questions like uh, what needs to happen to ensure the health and protection of water. We've already, I think, begun to move into that, so that's great. We can kind of start picking up on some of those things, uh, policies and practices that need to change, and things that also need that we can do at a personal level. So I think it's always important to look at both the personal and the more political uh, advocacy level. Uh, so on this round, uh, I think we're beginning with Joni and then uh, moving on to, to Jesse and Lena. There's so much to say. <laughs> um, first and foremost, um, in writing our relationship, uh, the most important relationship that we need to write right now, our relationship with water and our relationship with all um, the more than human world, uh, the more than human life 
and uh, from every small thing that lives to um, the wisdom within Indigenous nations that are still here among us today to share with us a way of being with the world. Um, I grew up that this was a commodity. It was a something that came out of a tap. Even though I swam in it and I saw it in all those special ways that I brought those pictures to you earlier, I have come to learn that Nibi, water, is not an object, but it is a flowing, living being. And our relationship has to change with water. Water is life. Water is this word that we have in English is always an objective way of being with um, the world. And it's why Indigenous languages are so incredibly important because they flow from the land and the words are not easily translated because they are action, they are connection, they are relation. I don't have an Indigenous language, but there are um, folks uh, around where I live here at Bawating that are language holders who speak the languages, who share their knowledge of languages. And I think everything we can do to bring language forward is extremely important. Uh, the Day Cho. I will never again call it the Mackenzie River. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> it's uh, very important uh, that we, we look at this um, in this way. Um, I would like to, uh, where is my share screen here, just for a quick second. Um, I know I have to be quick here. Um, play from the current slide here. Uh, we are coming into a season right here uh, in the Maple Forest, which was a time of gathering here at Baoting from for, for thousands of years. And when the water flows through the sugar maples, uh, this is a reminder that water flows through the earth and through our beings all around us. And that um, everything that flies and everything that lives, everything is water. And all of the beings that we see alongside of the water as we travel nearby, one of the little things that I thought at the end of this that I could bring forward once again is the uh, issue around the access to clean drinking water as a basic right of all life. Uh, just recently, a, connect, um, a contract was signed with a huge uh, corporation in Southern Ontario to draw enough bottled water from the groundwater that when you fill all the bottles, you can encircle Mother Earth, this globe, seven times with plastic bottles full of water. Commodifying the most great source of life that water is, is a criminal act. And uh, by not buying drinking water in plastic bottles and getting our waters and making them available, clean, accessible, Drinking water is a basic right for all life, all human life, and uh, in Indigenous nations, it's an absolute priority to get the bottled water advisories lifted and the communities with clean drinking water. Um, Joan, there Joan, was, Joan, yeah. just, sorry, your image is not showing. Oh, we see okay. Just, uh, yeah. <laughs> That is crazy. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Thank it you happens. for sharing that with me. Um, let's see, uh, stop screen sharing. Okay. <laughs> well, that wasn't very helpful of me now, was it? But I had an image and it was just of all these plastic water bottles <laughs> and what they represent. Um, it's, um, it's just like one of those small things. And the last thing I would like to um, uh, say is um, the water song, the Nibi water song. Um, when I um, was um, Joanne Robertson, um, who walked with Josephine Mandeman and was involved with the water walk around all the Great Lakes, um, the 
the words to water that every single one of us, every single day out loud needs to say, water, we love you. Water, we thank you. We respect you. And, and we say that to water. And um, I just, I can't share my screen here, I guess, but uh, I just, there's a song, if you look up Mother Earth Water Walk. So I just wanted to end with that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joni. Uh, now we'll turn it back to Jesse. Mm, thanks, Joni. I love your I love your spirit and your kindness. Um, you know, I'm wearing this shirt today, this orange shirt, um, because of the recent discovery of the children in Cap Capuino in Northern Alberta in Treaty 8. Um, it's a heavy time for Indigenous people. You know, we're, we're waking up with heavy hearts and, um, <clears throat> you know, we show up in spaces and, and uh, we carry that grief with us. You know, both of my Mushams attended residential school and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, just to the, the constant, um, the constant grief, because we're almost at 10,000 children and that's, I don't even know if they've done a quarter of the schools yet. And um, it, it goes back to relationships, you know, um, when colonization happened, the colonizers came here with the doctrine of discovery, which said that the people on these lands weren't even human. And they were treated as such and that and we're seeing that today with the bodies that we're digging up like I, I have children, they're six years old. And I think of um, you know, we've been seeing images of um, <clears throat> a six-year-old boy in a casket being buried at a residential school. And as parents, like, we, we, we can't imagine that. And I know that there's a lot of people who, who have come to these lands um, that are working to, to right those wrongs. But it's like, how do you do that? You know, how do you right those wrongs? Um, and and it goes back to land back you know and and what does that mean and and people get scared by that term land back because it's um you know we're not trying to chase people away but indigenous people only have two percent of all of this land that they you know in what's known as canada and uh, we are stewards of the land we do take care of the land and water and so you know, for all of us, like me, you, all of us here, we want to, we want a better world. We want a better society. Like we see what's happening uh, across the pond, and you know, those are fragment fragmented relationships, and they're not in tune with um, natural law and with water. And I see people like Joni and a lot of other people that, you know, we we want to have we want to have peace. And we want to have love and we want to have good relationships with each other and how how do we do that and that's you know part of that is returning land to indigenous people we're trying to have uh we're trying to have economic growth in our communities and we can't because our populations are growing we only have enough room for houses and even then we don't have in some communities we don't even have room for all the houses and so for me to teach my children to be stewards of the land and take them to the waters and help take care of the waters, we need to have those waters to do those teachings. Um, and so to me, that's part of building that relationship with water of how do we move forward is, you know, having these hard conversations of, um, you know, these, the, the, the beginning of what's known as Canada to where we are now, we, we can never forget history. We can never rewrite history. We need to acknowledge history and we need to right the wrongs of history. And personally, what I do, so the elders will always say, take it to your home. I'll say, I wanna learn the Cree language. We wanna learn the language. We wanna you know, learn songs. We wanna learn, learn ceremonies. The elders will always tell us it starts in your home. And so with my connection to water, because I have a cistern. So everybody, everybody, you have a tap. 
And in that tap, whatever you put down your drain goes somewhere back into the water. So I'm not only going to say, oh, I have a cistern and it feeds my horses like you're any different. We all are responsible in our homes for what we put down our drains. So that's where I started it. I started in my home. I, I don't use bleach. I don't use laundry soap. I only use baking soda. I don't use bounce. Bounce has formaldehyde in it and all kinds of chemicals. I'm really trying to figure out what kind of dish soap I can use, shampoo, even thinking of lotions. Like as you start to get more on the journey, you start to realize like everything, you know, like that everything has some, you know, and it's it's it goes back into our water. And so that's a journey I'm on and I'm I, I'm getting better at it. And, and it's like, what else can how can I wash my hair from the land? How can I wash my face from the land? You know, what makeups can I use that um, don't have lots of chemicals, like those kinds of things. And so I'm taking responsibility for that. Um, and so that's how I'm starting it in my home. So my children, that's normal to them. They they um, don't, we don't use laundry soap. We don't use um, bounce and all of these things. That's their normal. So I'm breaking that cycle in that way. So that's, it starts in your home. What can you do today? I'll pass that on to Lena. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, and that reflection around uh, land back so important as well, I think. Uh, certainly, I think probably many people on this webinar would know about that in terms of the forums work we've been working a lot around this dialogue that guide on listening to Indigenous voices, but particularly to understand, I think for, for many settler Canadians to understand that land is much more than a than a thing, it's it's a relationship. And that's true with water as well. And I think part of the journey uh, is is really, you know, looking at ways to, to return sovereignty to Indigenous people and uh, to, you know, there's a lot of research as well that has shown that where, that the best cared for lands on earth are cared for by Indigenous people. So that's also, that, that linkage is very strong. Uh, so, uh, on to Lena for to share some reflections on this question. It's really interesting hearing. I mean, it's not like I'm unaware of the impacts of colonization and the colonial project on on the indigenous communities of Canada, what we call Canada. What I inadvertently bought into when my family moved to Canada, but. Um, it's interesting because I reflect on how this is for my own community. Um, Sri Lanka was also a British colony, very uh, broken up and disconnected from its own history. We have an indigenous community there that is almost extinct. It's, it's just horrible. And when I think about right relationship, not just here in my own backyard, but I think about my community in, in other parts of the world, I just think about how there, there, can, there are people who do just amazing work, but there's just so few of them and they're fighting these forces that have been put in place hundreds of years ago and have been continued and moved forward because they, um, they um, benefit the elites and the powerful in, in our, our countries back home that have caused wars and all kinds of things. And, and here we are, here I'm, now I'm here. And you, you, yeah, just like conflicts around the world. Now I think we have, to, we have to come together as a global society to address climate change, but here we are being, you know, dragged back into wars and, you know, like 40 year wars, like what's going on in Palestine and Israel or like all over the place. And it's just, now is not the time to be at war with each other. Now we need to come together and, and how are we going to look beyond our greed now? Um, and address and address what we what we need to do for the future. But um, I can also be a very practical person <laughs> and focus on the work that I do at Water Should Watch. So I suppose when it comes to our relationship with fresh water and salmon, nothing is more powerful at this time. Unfortunately, I say unfortunately because I know it's incredibly tiring work. But um, speaking up and lobbying like getting to know your, your local decision makers is an incredibly important, uh, is an incredibly important tool, like knowing them and, and making sure that they understand your concerns about um, 
water or salmon or or caribou or or you know any of the species in your communities in your watersheds making sure they understand that you are concerned you want action taken by government is incredibly 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 powerful because they actually listen and i've heard this on numerous occasions from different um uh, you know, elected officials and, and senior government bureaucrats, they need to know that people care. They need to know that there's a groundswell. And, and they need to understand that the, the public interest is great enough so that they have the, the, the impetus to take it forward and, and move from theoretical plans to action. Um, we do a lot of work with local First Nations in and around the Lower Fraser. And I was actually thinking about the name for the Fraser and remembering that a few years ago, there was this conversation about, we need to re-indigenize the Fraser River. Why do we call it the Fraser after Simon Fraser? But then there was also this parallel conversation being like, but the Fraser is known by different names, depending on whose territory is going through. So how do we name it? And therefore, I don't know, maybe that conversation will come up again, but in the Lower Mainland, it's Stolo and uh, and still a nation of people who live um, uh, are the indigenous communities that live in along the Lower Fraser. Anyway, we work with a number of um, Lower Fraser nations, and there's really a lot of alignment between what organizations like ours are calling for and what the nations want. And so there's just, it's an incredibly powerful um, collaboration, I think, to, to work with, uh, with indigenous communities, support them, and um, as uh, as Jesse said, you know, we bring some of that Western scientific knowledge and indigenous communities bring the traditional knowledge. And I think over here, the local nations call it two-eyed seeing. So you're seeing from both sides. And that I think can really help um, bring the conversations around uh, salmon conservation, um, changing the way we manage for floods in better management of our watersheds can, can bring it all together. Government policy needs to change, of course. Um, and the problem there is government inertia, hence the, the, the public push is needed. It's not just once a year, or sorry, not once a year. Every four years we go out there and vote for who we want in parliament. Uh, we have to do that work every day. It's our responsibility as citizens. And I know it's a lot to ask for because there's just so many other uh, pressures and stresses uh, in our everyday that we're trying to deal with. I understand that even I get overwhelmed when I see other social justice issues I want to get involved with and like write to my MLA about or my MP. And then I'm like, oh, I'm so tired and it's exhausting work. And at that time, I actually take some time to myself. I go into nature, I remind myself why I'm doing what I'm doing. I take a bike ride. I uh, spend some time looking out the window. I play with my cat. I just like self-care is just so incredibly important in doing this work. And I really urge anyone who is who, who is inspired or wants to get involved in some way to to do the work but also take time for yourself because that's really important so many policies and practices need to change <laughs> i don't even know where to begin but when it comes to the work that i'm doing in the lower fraser you know we want to uh, move away from that hard gray built infrastructure and start to look at nature-based solutions and green infrastructure we want to stop thinking about managing floods because you can't manage floods. Floods are a natural part of, of the environment and of what water does. It's one of the many personalities of water, as Joni mentioned. But we need to think about how do we live in our floodplain? Because we live, we don't, li we can't control water, but we can control our actions on it. And so, um, yeah, policies and 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 practical actions should be focused around that like changing the way we think about land and think about water and there's been a lot of talk since our since our november floods about building back better actually heck i think it happened like when covid first began let's build back better we can build back better and i really love the concept of build back better when it started but now it's just become a bit of a um a talking heads thing like it sounds like a great slogan but really the concept of building back better and building back better together with indigenous communities that's a conversation we're having right now and it's a conversation we are forcing our government to have with us and um you know knowing that there's public support for this kind of work gives us the added energy to keep going and to keep pushing and know that we're pushing in the right direction so i'll stop there but uh, yeah there there's there's so much to say thank you so much lena 
Uh, I know that now we have, we've been gathering some questions from the audience. I think uh, Trevor and, uh, and Victoria are going to share some of those. Sure, um, thank you everyone. So we're gonna conclude our portion of this evening with um, some questions that we've received from, from um, all who are here this evening. And we, well, we only have about 10 or so minutes before concluding remarks, so we don't have a lot of time. So, but I wanna direct this first question. It's really for Jesse um, with the Keepers of the Water. And the question is who or what authority would organizations like Keepers of Water like to declare um, the status of personhood for water? Who speaks yeah, for the water? Yeah. I've seen that question. So it's this is a it's not a, a thing that's going to happen overnight because we're doing it differently where we're not only looking at a river, we're looking at a watershed. And so we're just doing a small portion. There's already uh, communities up in Northwest Territories that are looking at this. And so we did an initial research report on our website you can see that and now what we are doing as an organization is we'll be collaborating not collaborating i want uh we're going to engage some of the communities up north um and and have conversations so it's really about relationship building right now and discussion so keepers can't say who we're going to take it to because um you know it's it's like it it's a it's a new concept of trying to give um it, it's it's just one avenue that we're trying to do to protect the river but we can we can only bring in what we can bring in as an organization this is a huge collaboration with other other first nations and communities so it's 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 really exciting and i'm looking forward to you know the coming months and and years of this work Thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a it's it's a hard question to answer. I can appreciate, and it's it's really a cultural change. You know, it's it's not going to happen overnight. So, <laughs> yeah, but it's a wonderful concept, a wonderful idea. Lena, you may have seen the question for yourself, um, and that is, how has the sacredness of the salmon been elevated uh, by groups like yourselves and Indigenous leadership as part of the recent decisions to remove uh, salmon farms? So I don't work specifically on the salmon farm issue, but I did try to speak a little bit to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote my answer to Paul okay. in, in the little Q&A there. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do work very closely with Indigenous communities in, a, in and around the Broughton Archipelago and the Discovery Islands. And it's been a long-standing relationship. It's like 20 years plus. Um, in fighting the salmon farms and our work, our work, like we see our, our, our role in this in supporting what the nations of this region want. And so what we do is raise awareness and we, we do science to support, um, to, to support, well, well, to show, like to actually depict exactly how uh, terrible the salmon farms are. So um, yeah, so we definitely, uh, through all of that work, like, he, uh, like Paul asked about the sacredness of the salmon, and I've heard my colleague speak to this quite a bit when he attends meetings with um, indigenous leaders and, and with indigenous communities, like that is so central to everything that is being done. And it helps us, um, it, it just helps bring a different perspective to, to our work as well. Like we're not doing this simply from a science base, but there is so much more heart and soul in this work, so. I did send this question to my colleague who, who is kind of uh, running our salmon farming um, uh, campaign. And I will share his answer when he responds to me before, the, before we end here. Thank you, Lena. And Joni, you may have seen the question for yourself, more for yourself, but it's, you know, it's related to water's not only a resource, but it's, um, it's a place to go for refreshment and to renew ourselves. And, and you and Gary and um, your colleagues are so, in, you know, so involved in introducing people uh, to the beauty and the grace of water. Um, and so it's just, how do you do that? What's your, what's your vision behind that in introducing people to the water? 
how best to introduce people to the beauty of water in, a, in an ecologically sustaining way. You know, I think I'll just add, you know, I have access to a lake I go to north of Montreal. I, I mentioned it to you and I don't find it relaxing all the time because it's filled with water skiers and houseboats. And <laughs> I feel like I'm at a, di uh, at a disco sometimes <laughs> all day. So it's, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, um, I guess I could say like a couple of things is um, it's, it's a very um, important work when, uh, as Jesse said, it starts at home. It starts in our individual lives. And as Lena said, we can feel completely overwhelmed in this sphere because there is so much that is so interconnected between the inequalities um, of humanity and the way we live and the effects that colonization has had. Climate change is essentially a manifestation of colonization. And there um, are ways in which we can have conversations that are sometimes difficult. And, I, um, and I, I'm finding like the one-on-one -on -one with friends, family, and um, folks, that having them out on the water with a paddle in your hand on the river really changes people's perspective. And when we started the Canoes for Conservation program three years ago, um, we said, well, we're not gonna do it up on Lake Superior. We're gonna bring it here to Bawating because really the big canoe, although is often seen as a voyager canoe is for us a canoe that is a, um, a result of amazing technology that was brought about by the materials of the land and brings us to the water and the travel on water. How can we bring people of all ages and abilities and multi-generations and the big canoe with two interpretive trained guides uh, helping to share those stories where we can bring elders and other traditional ecological knowledge holders, Western science expertise, and bring them into this vessel on the water really helps us to see the water in a different way. Many people who have gotten on the St. Mary's River in the last few years through the big canoe have, uh, it, you know, seen this city that they live in and this place that they live in, uh, to have a paddle in your hand to propel yourself over these waters or see where the whitefish rapids are um, and connect to the residential school site, which as Shirley Horn, who uh, passed chief of Missanabe Cree, who went to school there, brought there when she was five, she said it is a way that, um, you know, uh, children were brought by the river to this school and they are too uncovering the young ones that were buried here. And there is a site of burial there. And these stories, if we bring people from the water to the land through the new teaching institute and up to this place of children of Shingwak, and then we take them back to the river, it's almost like we take people back to the land and the canoe makes that possible. So that's a bit of a long answer, but, um, if nobody, if anybody here on this call has ever read Robin Kimmerer, Kimmerer's, uh, Wall Kimmerer's books, Braiding Sweetgrass, it's a very beautiful book on how we look at Western science underpinned with a foundation of traditional ecological knowledge about the land. And I encourage anybody, and I'll also put something in the um, chat here if I can figure out. And it was a link I received from the Dave with the Zuki Foundation about having difficult conversations with families and friends. It is some of the best information I received um, to have those one on one conversations about anything around water, salmon, climate change or whatever. Thank you, Joni. Thank you, everyone. And maybe I'll just conclude with this final question. It's maybe uh, jo uh, Jesse would be the best to speak about it in any way she can. And it's just saying a few words about the land back movement. Could you say a little bit, bit more about that and maybe how it's related to the water and our access to water? And well, been? yeah, and that's, that's uh, thanks for asking that. Well, really quickly, the only mechanism that indigenous communities have to get land back right now is through, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, when they're, going to court um and they're trying to get their land back I, I lost the 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 wording for it but um they they have to go to court that's the only 
the only mechanism they have right now and why is it important so why should you care you know whether indigenous people get land back and it and then again it goes back to like reconciliation and healthy communities and um, a healthy society so if we're healthy as indigenous people and our children are healthy your children are going to be healthy you know and that and that's part of that re reconciliation is um you know we want to live in that kind of society i want my children to to live in 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 a safe place and you want your children to live in a safe place and if indigenous people because let's face it in canada we have a peaceful country because of indigenous people you know when we have when we're on the front lines we're not carrying weapons we're not violent people you know and that and that and that still stands today so we live in a safe canada because of indigenous people we have set the tone for that and so you know if we're allowed to continue that connection then we we continue those teachings and those teachings are why we are who we are today you know to live in harmony with natural law and so to have those teachings we need to we need that that land we need to be able to you know frog lake needs more land kahiwan needs more land saddle lake needs more land because they're they're at they're busting at the seams in these tiny little plots of land that they were forced to be in they are busting at the seams they need land they need more land to like have our traditional practices so that we can teach our children and it's better for everybody that's that's really truly the the true answer there thank you jesse Mark and Victoria, do you have anything to uh, add? Or? Yes, uh, just to, to maybe begin to draw draw things to a close, as I know we're five minutes away from, from it. Yeah, just uh, just to kind of uh, maybe follow up around that and back. I mean, one of the things that I know in preparing the, the guide listening to Indigenous voices was very clear when one re looks at the legal uh, framework is that there is no seat at land in Canada or what we call Canada. There, there was never no oral treaty ever seat at land. So, I, I mean, I think for, for many of, uh, of us who are settlers or newcomers, we might not have ever heard that important piece of information because we've been taught that treaties are about seeding land, but that was never, never the case. It was about, uh, you know, living together in a in a in a way that was fair and just and equitable and that isn't what has happened often uh, in, in most cases right uh, partnership on the land yeah so i think in terms of uh you know i, I would give it, maybe we'd have time for if each panelist wants to say if you have a one minute message that you want to to leave our our uh, webinar uh, participants with tonight, what would it be like? If there's something that you would want them to leave or to take away tonight, what what's the one thing you'd like them to remember out of this? Uh, can go in any order. Okay, since since no one's talking, I'll go. I'll just share the teaching with you. Um, that that the there's natural laws Cree laws that were given in two of the the first law so you know how you have the ten commandments our first law is love and our second law is helping each other and so I always come back to that you know when, when I'm sitting in circle here or when I'm sitting in circle anywhere and sometimes I want to get angry sometimes I I want to be mean <laughs> you know or or anything like that and I go back to that teaching of love and I'm teaching my children that so I just that's what I want to leave people with is like those are real real instructions given from creator that's how we are supposed to be existing with each other is in love and my auntie tells me that's the ones that run the sweat they said the longest journey that you'll have in your life is from your head to your heart and I always try and like if I'm thinking out of my head and then I'm like what is my heart saying? Sometimes it's hard to look at your heart, you know, because it's like you're you're sad there sometimes, or you're you know, like it's your heart is so powerful, and uh, our heart is so loving and kind. So I just I want to leave that with you guys. I want to leave love, and I want to leave my heart with you. So hi hi kinana skumpton. Thank you very much, Jesse. I can go next. I'm totally riffing 
off of what Jesse just said. Um, I have like a, like a spiritual teacher, I guess, and he always says, thank your heart. Every day, touch your heart and say, I love you, heart, and like really connect with it because if you're not connected here, there's no point just being connected up here. So you know, just like say good things to it. Be kind to your heart and then be kind to yourself. When you're kind to yourself, you can be kind. The kindness spreads. Um, however, on a more practical note, I really do encourage people to get, like, be advocates for your local watershed. Like, learn about the water, learn about where you live, understand the natural natural world around you, and 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 just write a letter or make a phone call to your MLA or your MP and let them know that this particular watershed is not doing well. It's not healthy, and you know. You can do this for any watershed across Canada or, or, your, or your home watershed, but please do that. Please do get involved. And wherever you possibly can take the opportunities to get teachings and be in a uh, presence of Indigenous knowledge, uh, take those opportunities, find out about them in your communities, and you will learn so many things about the way to be with life and the land. Um, that's just really what I want to want to say. And um, this beautiful word that was given to us for our day for the water in September, a day for the water should be every single day. So um, yeah, let's look at water not as a commodity, but as a beautiful living thing that we are. <laughs> Thank you to, to all of our panelists with their beautiful words. Uh, it's been very moving to hear each of you and we, we're very grateful uh, for everything you've shared with us today. Uh, some people were asking whether this a recording would be available. This is being streamed to YouTube right now. So basically the recording is available after this is finished on the on the Jesuit Forum uh, YouTube uh, channel, but I also put the link in the chat at one point. Uh, and I just want to say that there are other events coming. We're planning to do a second event on water probably in early May, looking particularly at some of the, the justice issues around access to water. Uh, but I also, there's another event by Faith in the Common Good. And I think, uh, uh, yeah, Victoria just put the link in the, in, in the chat, it's uh, and kind of a, an interfaith uh, dialogue on the sacred nature of water. And that will be, I think on, I think it's March, uh, I remember right, it's March 22nd, so that's a Tuesday. Uh, so roughly about three weeks from today. And uh, so that might be another event you're interested in, then we'll be picking up with another event in May. And we will also be trying to to create a, one of our, in our newsletter open space, an issue uh, based on this webinar soon. So uh, thank you once again so much to everyone here and uh, especially to our panelists, to, to Joni, to Jesse, to Lena, you've all been magnificent and we've enjoyed you. And uh, I'll say goodbye when I hit the end button, this just ends and, and that's the way, way Zoom works. But uh, so, uh, I'll just say farewell and uh, here we, in, in Ontario, maybe people would use the expression which of course is, comes from Anishinaabe language, but thank you very, very much for, for all your contributions today. Thank you for organizing. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. And just point out there's a few more uh, Keepers of the Waters having an event on March 22nd for World Water Day as well. Yeah, it'll be streamed live. Just check out our Facebook. Okay. okay.